Good evening, Davide. Ciao, Giorgia. Hello, everybody. Buonasera. Buonasera. <laughs> so, Davide is today going to talk us about Italian food and beverage in Japan. Thank you, Davide. Thank you. I would like to thank everybody at Kafoskari for this. We need more of this, definitely. We need to confront uh, each other and talk more. Uh, I would also like to thank the ambassador for preceding me and for uh, talking about the numbers. So I won't go through the numbers. Uh, I'll talk about some stories because I think that stories are very important. Um, let me briefly introduce myself. I'll give you a little bit of a background of myself. I am from Florence. I studied in Florence at Florence University. I graduated in Japanese literature, uh, so very humanistic. Um, and while I was studying, um, I were countless uh, people that were asking me why on earth would I study Japanese? Because Japan bubble was about to burst, so it was burst already. Why would I study literature where everything was going towards um, economy, management. So my future looked really, really dark at that time. Regardless of that, I really enjoyed stories. I really enjoyed reading stories. I really enjoyed creating stories and I kept doing my path. After that, I got a scholarship from the uh, Japanese government. So I came to Japan to do a research uh, for two years on discrimination, again, something very humanistic. And even there, and I was already 30, so uh, the clock was ticking and people were really worried about myself, asking, what are you going to do with a, with a degree in uh, Japanese literature and furthermore with a research on discrimination? Well, uh, we'll go back to that. Um, but uh, long story short, um, I started working and I did a million different kind of jobs. And then 10 years ago, I ended up at the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Japan. And just the name Italian Chamber of Commerce in Japan felt really heavy on my shoulders. Uh, but uh, I understood with time that it could be a fantastic mean to um, display what I had learned at university studying literature. So um, why this premise? Because I would like today to stress the importance of marketing in Japan. I won't be as positive as uh, the ambassador has been. I will be a little bit more transient because um, the potentials uh, that, that Japan has for Italy are huge and they are used only within this percentage. So there is a lot more than we can do, but we need to use marketing. So let me get to the um, uh, the definition of marketing itself, and let's start from there. Let me share this, the screen. Okay, can you see the screen? Georgia, you're my only uh, point of reference. So if you go, yes? Okay, perfect. So this is the uh, definition that the New York Times gave of marketing in 2017, and it really, uh, it's, it's marketing as it is. Uh, nudo crudo, we would say in Italian. Marketing is uh, the art of telling stories that are so enchanting that the product moves towards the person. Uh, now, why I started from the, um, from the definition? I started from the definition because I will try to put this into the Japanese context, and I will try to look at uh, how Italian food is doing in Japan by answering three questions. So question number one would be, to what extent do Italians need to tell stories in Japan in order to tell the product? Question number two would be, how, in, how enthralling, how, how um, uh, strong uh, are Italian stories to Japanese? And to end, so do Japanese buy Italian products? Okay. Let me get back to you. All right, I would like to start by taking a quick look at the uh, Japanese market. 
So uh, as the ambassador uh, put it very nicely, uh, it's true, the Japanese market is uh, a very important market for, uh, for Italy. It is uh, the third world economy. It has 127 million consumers and they spend about 70,000 yen per month in food, which makes this the second uh, market for food consumption in, uh, in Asia after China. And obviously, for geographical constraints, Japan has to rely a lot on import from abroad, uh, which makes it the fourth uh, market uh, for import uh, uh, for f and um, So it is a very, very important market. Having said this, uh, Japan has some challenges that have been uh, gaining um, power, so in a negative way. One is the obviously uh, the shrinking economy. Japan is not doing very well. The second one is the shrinking uh, population, or better said, the aging population. Japan is uh, a country of old people. And unlike Italy, there's no new uh, comers. So the population is very, very old. And also, uh, yes, we do have the, uh, the EPA, so uh, many barriers have been knocked down, but still it will take some time until many products will be able to come into uh, Japan. So having said this, um, when I'm asked in Italy, I come to Italy, I used to come to Italy every two months, and when I came to Italy, usually producers ask me uh, uh, exactly what was asked before to the ambassador, what product would su have a success in Japan? Uh, at this point, uh, I would say that it's not at all a question of what product. I would say that it's a matter of uh, how you present the product. Uh, you know better than me because I believe the audience is uh, very acknowledged with uh, Japan and the Japanese culture. Uh, the, the form and the content uh, are ex exactly have the same importance in Japan. I believe it is the only country in the world where uh, a bottle of olive oil, if you tell a, consu a consumer, this bottle of olive oil doesn't look so good, but this is the best quality you could ever get. And next to it, there's a bottle of olive oil, which uh, you, you tell him uh, the quality is so-so, but the packaging is spotless and it looks cute and it's, it's appealing to the eyes. I think 80 or maybe 90% of the people would go for the uh, good looking bottle and not the uh, quality, high quality olive oil. So this is very, very important. The market is one of the most difficult uh, in the world. It is super competitive. Um, and the producer has really to listen to, uh, to the consumer because uh, uh, he cannot think that he would uh, introduce any product and the product will succeed just because it is an Italian product. Uh, there's a lot of uh, customization that has to be taken into account. Um, there has to be, um, um, the, the, the bottles should be smaller, so the quantity cannot sell as much as they do sell uh, in Italy. So the producer has to be very, very flexible. But uh, even more than that, he needs a good story in order to, to sell his, um, his product. But uh, let's take a, a quick look at the history of, of uh, FNB in Japan, of foreign FNB in Japan. Um, so with uh, the end of the World War II, uh, the first country that really made a big entrain in Japan was uh, the USA, of course. With his uh, rich and tasty uh, hamburgers, the fries, the milkshakes, it was uh, everything that the Japanese wanted, not so well done, not so elaborated, but because of that, it gave him a little bit of a freedom, a casual uh, kind of uh, environment that he could enjoy with his family. And um, so, for example, McDonald's and other uh, uh, fast food chains became very, very, very popular. And McDonald's is, as of today, uh, for Japan, Japan is the second market for McDonald's. So uh, it's huge what uh, the fast food uh, culture is done in Japan. But this was let's say in the 50s, 60s. Japanese are too sophisticated. Uh, they have the history uh, and culinary tradition is too uh, long, too rich, too sophisticated to be content with the USA. So around the uh, 70s, they started looking for a different model of reference. And then that's when France uh, came uh, with uh, the elaboration, with the classy, with the history, with the elegance, most of all. 
and France really imposed itself as the country, uh, the culinary country to look at. But uh, many chefs that would go to uh, France to do a field work after um, studying in Japan or in order to enrich their curriculum, um, they would also travel to Italy. And thanks to them, thanks to the chef, they would travel to Italy. And when in Italy, they would compare French and Italian uh, food with Japanese food, they would find that there were striking similarities with, between uh, Japan and Italy because the ingredient came before the elaboration. Uh, also, Italy and Japan put the family at the middle, at the center of, of the society, so in good and bad, but family is very important. The bonds are very, very important. Uh, so little by little, Italy started um, coming into Japan from the back door. Also, that's when Japanese uh, used to uh, travel a lot. And so within the European tour, they would go to Italy and uh, Obviously, like France, Italy was also a European country, so it uh, embodied the values of elegance, which is, was very important and is still very important, tradition, art, history. But there's one thing, and this is what is making us so successful. There is one thing that only Italy can give to Japanese, and there's no uh, France, there's no Germany, there's no uh, America that can do that the way we do which is our uh, peculiarity. We are bright, we are optimistic, we are funny, we are sociable, we are unpretentious. Uh, unlike French that would give an attitude to Japanese, we are welcoming. So it was easier, it is easier for a Japanese to identify with an Italian while still looking at us as art, uh, tradition and, and, uh, and history. So this is the most important uh, aspect of our culture in Japan, and it's what is making us so successful. But it's not being used as much as it should be. Um, so Japan is very present in, in uh, sorry, Italy is very present in Japan, as uh, the ambassador was saying, of course. FMB is very strong. We have, I don't know how many restaurants, Italian restaurants in Japan. Some people say 12,000, some people say 15,000. And regardless of that, the Italian flag is everywhere on the street and it's everywhere in the supermarket. Uh, so we are very, very present, but, but uh, I, I am not so um, <clears throat> optimistic as the ambassador on the figures. Italy for uh, the, the culinary production and tradition that we have is not uh, where it should be within the Japanese market. Uh, we have less than uh, we have than the ten percent of the market share of foreign uh, countries in Japan for uh, foreign um, food, which is very low, I, I believe. Uh, Holland, so to speak, is ahead of us. So now with the EPA being Mm, uh, enabled and with the barriers being taken down, I am sure there will be uh, a lot of improvements, but still there's a lot to do. Also wine, uh, France is much ahead of us and uh, Chile uh, has been ahead of us for a very long time. Now we are, we are trying to uh, go uh, 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 to take over Chile, but still it's not uh, so easy. So uh, there is much more than we can do. Uh, and this is so a strong idealization of Italy, a strong presence and, and a super strength of the brand made in Italy towards uh, figures that tell something else. So obviously there is something that we are not doing well enough. Uh, and especially uh, we're not doing that well enough if we consider the Japanese consumer. Uh, I mean, Japanese consumer is, uh, I would say, the hardest uh, in the world. It is super sophisticated. It is super difficult. Um, um, quality has to be at the top. Uh, he wants always something that is new. He wants something that is uh, giving new emotions. Uh, it gets really bored easily. And uh, if he trusts unconditionally uh, made in Japan, made in Italy or any made of in, in other uh, international food, is he has a thousand question marks. He's not so trust, trustworthy to work. Uh, foreign uh, imported food. Now, there was a question before about uh, new uh, consumers. Um, yes, um, so this is uh, also maybe something we can, and we have to think of when we uh, approach the Japanese market. 
obviously number one, I would say uh, the elderly, they are the biggest uh, um, portion of consumers uh, with special um, uh, needs for their diet, obviously. Uh, the one person household uh, people with a lot of money to spend, so they want something that really fulfills their need of uh, identifying with uh, uh, niche and, uh, and, and top-notch uh, elegant products. We have uh, finally uh, the men, I would say the new men, the new salary men, finally men uh, like they, what they've done with fashion, finally they've come out of their comfort zone, even with food. They don't just eat anything that is easy to eat, ready-made. Now they, uh, of course, need still to be fast. Uh, so it has to be practical what they eat, but they also want to fulfill the uh, need of uh, identifying with something that is a little bit extravagant. So uh, within that respect, I think Italy can uh, uh, can do much. We have the post-Fukushima, of course, uh, that are very healthy, healthy conscious. So uh, we have um, also with this COVID, people have discovered uh, that eating at home, uh, you know, better than me that in Japan, uh, a worker tends to eat out three, four times uh, a week at, for dinner. Now, after Fukushima a little bit, and now with COVID, of course, uh, he's been obliged to uh, eat at home. So there's a discovery of uh, uh, cooking for yourself. So this is also... Um, an option. And then within this, and then I'll, I'll end up and I'll go back to my initial, um, to the initial uh, emphasizing the story, we have the Italian producer. So we have uh, a very competitive market, we have a super difficult um, uh, customer, and then we have an Italian producer. So every time I come to Italy, um, and I come specifically to look for products and for producers that are willing to approach and to come to Japan. What I feel the most is frustration. And I feel frustrated because, um, as I said before, Italy has so much, so much, but uh, it does so little in terms of promotion. Um, uh, and, and this is because uh, we don't have within our DNA, in our uh, business history, apart from the huge brands, uh, the inclination to, to uh, think of marketing as something that has to be done. It's not an option. It's not a plus. It's not something that you can decide to do or not. You have to uh, do a good, not only do marketing, you have to do a very good marketing campaign if you want to approach a market as saturated, as complicated, as sophisticated as uh, the Japanese one. So uh, we, we have everything that it takes. We have um, tradition, we have um, craftsmanship, we have the history behind the brand, we have the people, we have everything. We just need to really tell a story. Now, um, what I said before about Italians um, looking bright and positive to Japanese, uh, I think it's still undervaluated. Uh, this is something that should be really used at a higher level uh, when planning a marketing campaign. Why? Um, because um, when a Japanese uh, look at us, he looks at a possibility. And when I say us, of course, I mean at a product. Uh, so I'm talking about in the, the emotional experience that you have when you, when you purchase uh, uh, an item. When he, when he buys something that is Italian, he doesn't just buy something that is, of course, elegant, uh, valuable, uh, that has tradition, that has the craftsmanship of the territory. This is all very important. But he buys something else, something that is even more important. When he buys Italian, he buys a piece of freedom. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't need to say here that Japan um, has changed immensely in the past 50, 60 years. So uh, it, it is not anymore a middle-class society, it is a divided uh, class society. So um, outcome are not the same for everybody anymore, but the rules, they're the same. Uh, Japan uh, is the country of the rules. Uh, at work, uh, uh, 
at home uh, with friends. Um, so from gender to work to the rules are a heavy burden for Japanese. Um, I don't need to state that Japan, unfortunately, is uh, comes, I think, 62nd or 63rd in the list of the most unhappy, uh, sorry, of the most happy uh, places. So Japanese don't have a vision of a bright future ahead of, of them. And I believe much of this is because of this frustration of having to um, obey rules. So if you're Japanese, you're... Um, you have to obey the rules. And, but what is uh, imposed to you from social media, uh, all the model of references, they scream at freedom, be yourself, uh, be whoever you wanna be, uh, love whoever you wanna love and do it the way you wanna do it. But it's not like that. That's just an idolization. And then in reality, you have to obey so many rules every single day, still today. And especially if you're a woman, it can be really frustrating working here. So uh, what I'm saying here is when you buy uh, an Italian product, uh, you buy uh, a product uh, made by people that are unconventional, that live the way they want to live in the eyes of the Japanese, that uh, scream uh, out their uh, diversity, their individuality, their positivity. So the emotional transfer, the emotional experience that you do when you buy something Italian is huge. And I think that this is a perfect um, concept that um, anybody can keep in mind when uh, planning a marketing strategy. And here again, it is not an option. You have to consider it as part of your, uh, uh, of your plan when you want to approach Japan. So number one, you have to study Japan. You have to really um, understand what the country is. The literature is all there. It's, everything is on the internet. So get on the internet. I'm talking to producers now, uh, if there's any that are listening. Go surf and study Japan deeply. This is the first thing you need to do. The second thing you need to do is to ask yourself if you're ready for Japan. Are you ready? Do you have production availability? Do you have flexibility? Can you customize? And then third, you have to uh, face this with a counterpart in Japan. You cannot do this alone. You need to have someone in Japan. Uh, maybe you've been able to do business with France. Good. You face business with Spain. Fantastic. With Germany. Great. Not with Japan. And it's not just uh, a cultural and linguistic uh, barrier. Um, it's also how Japanese perceive you. They need to have a Japanese counterpart that talks for you that they can trust. So after you've gone through these three um, obligatory uh, points, then come the fourth one, which is what I just said before. You need to do a marketing campaign, and it has to be a good one. Otherwise, I find it very, very difficult. But here again, if we can sell with our product a piece of freedom, who would not buy that? I would. So going back to the introduction and to my story, and now I'm talking to any student that might be listening now, or I've, I've heard that this is going to be uh, recorded. So maybe later on, among you, if there is someone who is struggling and who's studying uh, literature or something more humanistic and not uh, marketing, managing, trend analysis or whatsoever, don't worry. Uh, you can learn how to do uh, analysis and how to read a chart. You can learn that. But what you cannot learn is uh, to go deep and into the, the human uh, soul and 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 make treasure of that and tell a story and learn how to tell a story. So don't worry, keep doing what you're doing if you like it, uh, because there's always going to be someone who needs you to tell a story in order to sell his product. And I think um, within the time constraint. Thank you very much, Davide. It was extremely fascinating. Japanese people experience, ex 
experiencing freedom by the consumption of Italian products that were extremely insightful for us. And we have collected actually a lot of questions. So first of all, uh, we have Natalia. You can go ahead, thank you. Hi, Davide. Hi, everybody. Hello, Natalia. <laughs> uh, my question is having been on the side of producers on, on the side of Italy for one year before COVID and then one year after COVID. Um, how do you think it has changed? Because usually we came with producers to Japan, we went to the um, food fair, we had our booths and presented uh, the product to uh, importers, etc. While now we have to stay in Italy, we can't come to Foodex, we can't come to Achigusto, we can't do basically 90% of what our job was before. How do you think the producer can adapt to this new world that of course after COVID may go back to what it was before, but also maybe not. So what is the difference that you saw and you think what we can learn from our side, so from Italy after COVID? Okay, to start with, uh, since you mentioned the trade shows, uh, trade shows are very important, but not so much, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, trade shows are a good window uh, to tell the uh, uh, distributors and consumers that you are still in Japan, you're still coming, you still care for the market and, and you have to attend and you have to be there, but that's it. Uh, not much in terms of business happened at trade shows. So uh, as Chamber of Commerce, we had already stepped away from the trade shows, the traditional way of displaying and making. What we were doing before and what we kept doing even during COVID is uh, really one-to-one. -one. So um, who are you, what's your product and who are you targeting? And then we go to uh, a potential uh, counterpart and, and really we do the matching. And honestly, in the beginning, we, th we thought, okay, that's it. You know, how are we going to do this if physically they cannot come to Japan? But we started doing everything uh, remotely, of course. And with this, the, you know, the way we are interacting now, there's no difference. So what we do now, we have um, quite a large um, space here. Uh, so we transformed that into a showroom. So we asked producers to send us the um products we display them then we uh call uh buyers and distributors they come to our office they check the, pro the products if they like them they ask all sorts of questions once they're done uh checking the products if they're interested then they talk virtually with the producer and we mediate so really there's no much difference because the product is here and they can talk and ask all the questions they want to ask to the to the producer. So in the future, of course, once the relationship is established, I think it's very important that you nourish it, this and, and you come and you really um, grow together with your partner in Japan. But until then, I think it can be done this way. There's no need, honestly. So even when COVID is done, pretty much we're gonna keep going this way. Thank you, thank you very much. Keep up the good work. <laughs> So we have received so many other questions, wow. but for a very slight time issue, unfortunately, we, we, we have to proceed to the next relator. Thank you very much, Davide. It was an honor to have you here today. And I will forward you all the questions that we have received. Thank you.